Give me 20 minutes and I'll make discrete mathematics click for you. Forever. You've probably heard the words before. Logic, sets, graphs, algorithms. Maybe you've even seen them in a textbook, floating around like abstract puzzles. But here's the truth. These aren't random pieces of math. They're the language of computers, the foundation of every code, network, and system that runs our world. Before we start building, let's answer one simple question. What exactly is discrete mathematics? Think about all the math you've seen before. Curves, slopes, smooth motion. That's calculus, the math of the continuous. Now flip that picture completely. Discrete math is the math of separation, of things that can be counted, listed, or linked, but never blurred together. It's the math of decisions, logic gates, networks, and data. In the next 20 minutes, we'll build your complete mental toolkit. We'll start with logic, the art of reasoning, then move to sets, the language of belonging. We'll connect them through functions and relations, count possibilities with combinatorics, and travel through networks and graph theory. We'll test truth with proofs, turn logic into motion with algorithms, and uncover the hidden structure of numbers in number theory. And the best part? You won't memorize any of it. You'll build it piece by piece from one simple idea, that every system, no matter how complex, begins with something discrete. No magic, just mechanics. Let's begin. Our first stop is logic. Logic is the foundation of all reasoning. It's how we determine if an argument is valid or not. In logic, we work with statements. A statement is a sentence that is either true or false, but not both. For example, the sky is blue is a statement. It's true. During the play is also a statement. It's false. But what time is it is not a statement because it's a question, not a declaration. We can combine simple statements into more complex ones using logical connectives. Let's look at the most common ones. First, we have negation represented by this symbol. If P is a statement, not P is its opposite. If P is true, not P is false and vice versa. Next is conjunction or and represented by this upside down V. The statement P and Q is only true if both P and Q are true. If either one is false, the whole statement is false. Then we have disjunction or OR represented by a regular V. The statement P or Q is true if at least one of P or Q is true. It's only false if both P and Q are false. Finally, we have implication or if then represented by an arrow. The statement if P then Q is only false in one specific case, when P is true but Q is false. In all other cases, it's considered true. We can summarize the truth values of these connectives using truth tables. A truth table lists all possible combinations of truth values for the simple statements and shows the resulting truth value for the complex statement. Here's the truth table for implication. Notice how the statement, if P then Q is true, when P is false regardless of Q. This can be a bit counterintuitive at first, but it's a standard rule in logic. So, to recap, we've learned that logic is about statements that are either true or false, and we can combine them using connectives like not, and, or, and if then. Truth tables help us understand the truth value of these combinations. Our second topic is sets. A set is simply a collection of distinct objects. These objects are called elements or members of the set. We usually represent sets using curly braces. For example, the set of even numbers less than 10 would be written like this. This set, which we'll call E, contains the elements 2, 4, 6, and 8. Notice that the order doesn't matter, and each element is unique. There are a few special sets you should know. The empty set, written with a circle and a slash, is a set with no elements. The universal set, often written as U, is the set of all elements under consideration in a particular context. We can also describe sets using set builder notation. This is useful for very large or infinite sets. For example, the set of all integers can be written as a set of all x such that x is an integer. Now let's talk about relationships between sets. A set A is a subset of a set B if every element in A is also an element in B. We write this as A is a subset of B. For example, the set 1, 2 is a subset of 1, 2, 3. Every set is a subset of itself, and the empty set is a subset of every set. We can also perform operations on sets to create new sets. These are very similar to the logical connectives we just saw. The union of two sets A and B, written A union B, 
is the set of all elements that are in A or in B or in both. The intersection A intersection B is the set of elements that are in both A and B. And the complement of A written A bar is the set of all elements in the universal set that are not in A. A great way to visualize these operations is with Venn diagrams. A Venn diagram uses circles to represent sets and their relationships. Here, the shaded area represents the union of A and B. It includes everything in both circles. The intersection would be just the overlapping part. Venn diagrams are a powerful tool for understanding set theory. To summarize, sets are collections of distinct objects. We can describe them, find subsets, and combine them using union, intersection, and complement, which can be visualized with Venn diagrams. Next up, we have functions and relations. These concepts describe how elements from one set are connected to elements in another. Let's start with relations. A relation is simply a set of ordered pairs. An ordered pair is a pair of elements, say, open parenthesis, a comma b close parenthesis, where the order matters. For example, if set A is 1, 2, 3, and set B is x, y, the relation R could be the set of pairs, 1, x, 2, y, 3, x. This relation connects 1 to x, 2 to y, and 3 to x. A function is a special type of relation. For a relation to be a function, it must satisfy two conditions. First, every element in the first set, called the domain, must be paired with an element in the second set, called the codomain. Second, no element in the domain can be paired with more than one element in the codomain. In other words, each input has exactly one output. Let's look at our previous example. Is the relation r equals open parenthesis, 1 comma x close parenthesis, open parenthesis 2 comma y close parenthesis, open parenthesis 3 comma x close parenthesis, a function from A to B? Yes, it is. Every element in the domain A, which is 1, 2, and 3, is paired, and each element is paired with only one element in B. For instance, 1 is only paired with x, not with y. Now let's consider another relation. S equals 1, x, 1, y, 2, y. Is this a function? Number. The element 1 in the domain is paired with two different elements in the codomain, x and y. This violates the second condition for a function. So, to recap, a relation is any set of ordered pairs. A function is a special type of relation where every input has exactly one output. This concept of a unique output for every input is fundamental in all of mathematics and computer science. Our fourth topic is combinatorics. This is the branch of mathematics that deals with counting. It answers questions like, how many ways can I arrange these items or how many different groups can I form? Let's start with the most basic principle, the multiplication principle. If there are m ways to do one thing and n ways to do another, then there are m times and ways to do both. Imagine your pen are getting dressed. You have three shirts and two pairs of pants. And how many different outfits can you make? Using the multiplication principle, you multiply the number of choices for shirts by the number of choices for pants. Three times two equals six. You have six possible outfits. Now, let's talk about permutations. A permutation is an arrangement of objects in a specific order. The order matters. Let's say you have three books, A, B, and C. How many different ways can you arrange them on a shelf? For the first spot, you have three choices. For the second, you have two choices left. For the third, you have only one choice. So the total number of arrangements is three times two times one, which is six. This product, three times two times one, is six two times one, is called three factorial, written as three factorial. In general, the number of permutations of n objects is n factorial. The formula for permutations of n objects taken r at a time is n factorial n minus r factorial. This is used when you're arranging a subset of your objects. What if the order doesn't matter? That's where combinations come in. A combination is a selection of objects where the order does not matter. Let's say you have three books, A, B, and C, and you want to choose two of them to take with you. The combination A, B is the same as B, A. The order doesn't change the group. The formula for combinations is the permutation formula divided by r factorial, which accounts for the overcounting caused by different orderings. So, to recap, combinatorics is about counting. The multiplication principle helps us count sequential choices. Permutations are for arrangements where order matters, and combinations are for selections where order does not matter. Our fifth major topic is graph theory. Graph theory is the study of graphs, which are mathematical structures used to model pairwise relations between objects. A graph consists of two things, a set of vertices or nodes, and a set of edges or links that connect pairs of vertices. Imagine a social network. Each person is a vertex, and an edge exists between two people if they are friends. This is a perfect example of a graph. 
The vertices are the people and the edges are the friendships. Graphs can be directed or undirected. In an undirected graph, the edges have no direction. If A is connected to B, then B is connected to A. In a directed graph or digraph, the edges have arrows, meaning the connection only goes one way. A friendship graph is undirected. If you're friends with someone, they're friends with you. A Twitter follower graph is directed. You can follow someone without them following you back. There are many important concepts in graph theory. A path is a sequence of vertices connected by edges. A cycle is a path that starts and ends at the same vertex. A graph is connected if there is a path between every pair of vertices. A tree is a special type of graph that is connected and has no cycles. Trees are very important in computer science for organizing data. Graph theory is used to solve a huge variety of problems. Think about Google Maps finding the shortest route between two places. That's a graph problem. The internet itself is a massive graph. To recap, graph theory models relationships between objects using vertices and edges. Graphs can be directed or undirected, and concepts like paths, cycles, and trees are fundamental to understanding their structure. It's a powerful tool for modeling and solving real-world problems. Now that we've covered some of the main areas of discrete math, let's talk about how we prove things. This brings us to our sixth topic, proofs. In mathematics, we don't just guess, we prove. A proof is a logical argument that establishes the truth of a statement beyond any doubt. It's a step-by-step -step demonstration that a conclusion must be true if the premises are true. There are many different proof techniques. Let's look at a few of the most common ones. First, direct proof. This is the most straightforward method. To prove if P then Q, you assume P is true and then use logical steps, definitions, and previously proven theorems to show that Q must also be true. For example, let's prove that the sum of two even integers is always an even integer. We start by assuming P is true. We have two even integers. Let's call them M and N. By definition, an even integer can be written as two times some other integer. So M equals 2K and N equals 2J. Their sum is M plus N, which is 2K plus 2J. We can factor out a 2, giving us 2 times open parenthesis K plus J close parenthesis. Since K plus J is also an integer, the sum is 2 times an integer, which is the definition of an even integer. We have successfully shown that Q is true. Another powerful technique is proof by contradiction. To prove a statement P, you assume the opposite or negation of P is true. Then you show that this assumption leads to a logical contradiction. Since a contradiction cannot be true, your initial assumption must have been false, which means the original statement P must be true. Finally, we have proof by induction. This is used to prove statements about all natural numbers. It's like a chain reaction. You prove the first case, called the base case. Then you prove that if any case is true, the next case must also be true. This is the inductive step. Once you have these two pieces, you've proven the statement for all natural numbers. So, to recap, proofs are the backbone of mathematics. We've seen three common methods, direct proof, proof by contradiction, and proof by seduction. Mastering these techniques is key to thinking like a mathematician. Our seventh topic is algorithms. An algorithm is a finite sequence of well-defined, computer-implementable instructions, typically to solve a class of problems or to perform a computation. Think of an algorithm as a recipe, a set of clear, unambiguous steps that, if followed correctly, will always produce the desired result. Algorithms are the heart of computer science. A classic example is the Euclidean algorithm, which finds the greatest common divisor, GCD, of two integers. The greatest common divisor is the largest number that divides both integers without leaving a remainder. Let's find the GCD of 48 and 18 using this algorithm. The algorithm works by repeatedly dividing the larger number by the smaller number and taking the remainder. We start with 48 and 18. 48 divided by 18 is 2 with a remainder of 12. Now we repeat the process with 18 and the remainder 12. 18 divided by 12 is 1 with a remainder of 6. We repeat again with 12 and 6. 12 divided by 6 equals 2. 6 is 2 with a remainder of 0. The algorithm stops when the remainder is 0. The GCD is the last non-zero remainder, which is 6. A key part of studying algorithms is analyzing their efficiency. We want algorithms that are fast and don't use too much memory. We use something called Big O Notation to describe the growth rate of an algorithm's runtime as the input size increases. For example, an algorithm with O n complexity means its runtime grows linearly with the input size n. An algorithm with O n squared complexity means its runtime grows much faster, quadratically. Understanding Big O Notation helps us compare algorithms and choose the best one for a given task. So, to recap, algorithms are precise step-by-step -step procedures for solving problems. 
We can analyze their efficiency using tools like Big O Notation to understand how they perform as the input size grows. Our final topic is number theory. This is the study of integers and their properties. It's one of the oldest and most beautiful branches of mathematics, and it has surprising applications in the modern world. We've already seen one concept from number theory, the greatest common divisor. Another fundamental concept is modular arithmetic. Modular arithmetic is often called clock arithmetic. We say that two integers a and b are congruent modulo n if their difference a minus b is a multiple of n. In other words, they have the same remainder when divided by n. Let's look at an example. What is 17 congruent to modulo 5? We divide 17 by 5. The quotient is 3 and the remainder is 2. So 17 is congruent to 2 to modulo 5. This means that 17 and 2 have the same remainder when divided by 5. Modular arithmetic is incredibly important in computer science especially in cryptography. It's the mathematical basis for secure communication on the internet. Another key area of number theory is the study of prime numbers. A prime number is a natural number greater than one that has no positive divisor other than one and itself. Examples include 2, 3, I'm 7, and so on. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic states that every integer greater than one can be written as a unique product of prime numbers. This is like the building blocks of numbers. For example, the number 12 can be factored as 2 times 2 times 3. No matter how you factor it, you'll always end up with 2 2s and 1 3 3. This unique prime factorization is the basis for many number theory concepts. To recap, number theory is the study of integers. We've seen modular arithmetic, which is like clock arithmetic, and the importance of prime numbers as the building blocks of all integers. These concepts are not just abstract, they are the foundation of our digital world. This is the power of discrete mathematics the ability to think clearly, reason precisely, and build systems that never fail.